Good evening. This is Headline Crime. Literally a year ago, Parents Weekend, we were celebrating these amazing kids that we would raised. Everyone becomes a suspect and no one trusts anyone. Justice has never been obtained in that case. Court documents are revealing what Brian Laundrie's parents knew after her death. Welcome everyone to Headline Crime. I'm Susan Hendricks. You may know me for my many years at CNN and HLN and my extensive crime coverage. And I'm Dan Semitovich. You may know me or my voice from the hit podcast, Down the Hill, The Delphi Murders. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to the channel, like and leave a comment and tell your friends. This is how we're gonna grow this community. So please do that. And with that, let's jump right into the show with our big guest. Well, she can explain this more than most, right, Dan? Yes. Understanding the mind of a serial killer. Is it even possible? Well, for decades, the members of the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit have tried through communicating and analyzing some of the most vicious and notorious killers of our time. And if you know anything about the BAU, you know our guest, Dr. Ann Burgess. She's a renowned forensic nurse and criminologist who pioneered criminal profiling and helped establish the unit that became the BAU. If you've watched Mindhunter on Netflix, the character Dr. Wendy Carr is loosely based on Ann. During her career, she's interviewed, analyzed, and helped track down some of the most infamous serial killers out there. Names like Ed Kemper, BTK, Henry Wallace, all in the name of providing valuable insights into their minds and motivations. Personally, I am extremely nerdy about this kind of stuff, and so I'm very, very excited to have her here. Not only has Dr. Burgess paved the way in her field for decades, she is now part of a revolutionary new study that uses AI to analyze the writings, crimes, and psychological evaluations of mass shooters and serial killers to identify patterns and potential warning signs of violent behavior. And with us now is the legendary Ann Burgess. Ann, great to see you. Good to see you too, Susan. And I remember you and I did an interview back at HLN about Kemper. He is a very scary person. He did what we called extreme acts after he killed someone. He didn't just kill them. Was that the serial killer that you had the most interaction with? He was a very verbal one and a very forthcoming. I started developing the fantasies toward her, killing her. And in the decapitation fantasies were even there. They were, in, they were in place by then. So it was easy to tell the agents. It was easy to talk with them. Why do you think he was so forthcoming? I was really aware of the evil I was capable of. You know, the murderous violence. We had a lot to say, and he liked the attention. That mm -hmm. was part of the narcissism, right? Yeah. And so the longer he could talk, and he could talk, he, and he had incredible detail. Bob Ressler did an interview with him. Probably he was in his 40s, so it was a good 20 years later. And every detail that he had matched what uh, we had and what we had observed. So it's very bright, uh, no question about it. And these, uh, especially these serial killers that are bright, makes a huge difference. It seems that that recall, that attention to minute detail, like they won't remember things that are easy to remember, but they'll remember everything down to that last minute detail. They will. And they will kill you as if they're right there. You're going through it. I mean, they're reliving it. Yeah, well, they are. And they relive it in their head so much. All of that, you know, it's a kind of reverse PTSD, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching. A, I'm, I'm working on a project about Israel Keys, the serial killer. And when you watch his interrogation tapes, he starts relating uh, some of the crimes he committed. You see his hands rubbing the table, and you see him. You see him getting excited. At some point in time, you may your choices may your your choice may be the reality. Could be that Laney and everybody else knows what you did based on what you said you did. You could see him replaying it in his head. He's enjoying this, right? Yes. We're arousing to him. I think that's, is, of course, very important because that's where, and, th and that's very dangerous. I remember BTK in court, and I heard you talking about this, just recall acting like retelling the story. If I had brought my stuff and used my stuff, uh, Kevin would probably be dead today. 
I'm not bragging on that. It's just a matter of fact. It's the bonds I've uh, tied him up with that he broke them, so. And you could see his head kind of going back to that moment. Yeah. Yeah, Israel Keys, interesting. Uh, he, uh, in the inter- in his interrogation, FBI agents are uh, are asking him about other serial killers. You know who he took inspiration for, because you know, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this. These guys learn from others, right? Like they take, they oh, take absolutely, yeah. yeah. But he hated, like he didn't like BTK. He loved Ted Bundy. He loved H. H. Holmes. Why? He did not like BTK because he was a hack. He was too soft in his old age to actually go out and do anything again. So he decided to go the publicity route without actually doing anything and that's what was disappointing it's amazing to me like when you hear these guys talk how self-aware they seem right they, they've 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 thought their deeply own narrative about they have their own narrative right yeah they're bright and um, i wonder how much of it is true like you know how much is well there you are is it because it doesn't sound right, but it's something they believe. It's their world, right? Yeah, but they, you know they're yeah. self-aware enough where they study other serial killers and they try to learn from the way others were caught, the way others behaved, and so you know they're self-aware enough to know that what they are, and they're self-aware enough to seemingly grow and learn. Well, one of the things that that on Netflix and the um, uh, in the show he says, well, you know, prisons are like knitting circles. <laughs> Big Ed with his big mouth. Wait a minute. As far as I know, all his communication is monitored. What can I say? Prisons are like knitting circles. Word gets around. <laughs> and of course, then the agent got all nervous because it would spoil the research. You're not supposed to contaminate, you know, the research or anything. So how do you believe him? I always get caught up with how do you believe? Not necessarily. It's not that you have to believe everything. But what, what parts of it can you believe that actually happened? What I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how what happened. And I think this is a message I want to get across. Right. These guys lie. They lie. It's important to me and, uh, and that people that people believe what I'm saying. They play the game. They, they have their own ag- agendas. At a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of things. Now, I really want to understand that. Like Bundy, didn't he say it was pornography that made him turn? And that made him do it. Yeah. Are we really going to believe this guy the day before he's executed <laughs> on, on what was the cause? Even though we do want to understand it, it just that was haunting that interview that he did. Yeah, we're doing an interesting project now because we're trying to move beyond they're telling us what they're doing and find out if there's another way to get into their mind about hmm. how they think about something. So we're using artificial intelligence. Oh, tell us more about that, please. We need their writing. So we found 23 um, manifestos. Not only are these killers anxious to talk but they write a lot especially if they're very bright so we took those and we ran it through uh, the machine learning that's the the technique and it, it's really come up with three very interesting categories if you will and then we every time we get a new one we can match that one against the 23 to see what patterns we get the the um, topics a lot of times you'll find out topics that they don't bring up verbally but it's in their writings and in their head that they're interested in. And so it can make for new topics to interview them on. What is it that they're communicating and, and to whom are they communicating it? What's their what's their intended audience for a writing? Oh, the audience is everybody. Mm-hmm. Look at Ted Kaczynski. He had to have it published in the two big papers, newspapers. What are they trying to figure out with AI, which I find fascinating, once they are put in categories and you're able to write, instead of just listening to them and and taking their word for what it is, what do you think is the ultimate goal to kind of predict behavior like this, maybe? Our ultimate goal is threat assessment. So law enforcement gets a lot of threats. You know, I'm going to kill 20 people. And they don't know what to do with them. They're frightening because, you know, you don't want, are uh, they going to really do it? So we want to, there is a whole six series of step assignments that we're analyzing so that when we get a threat, a fresh one, a police department send us one, 
we can run it through, compare it with the ones we already have and see how big a threat they are. Are they just at a grievance level? They all start off with a grievance and then you categorize the grievance. And then how much do they do research on how they're going to plan it? How much is the planning? Um, and, and all of those steps are kind of spelled out. And actually, Elliot Rogers, uh, for one of the newer ones, Ted Kaczynski, of course, was is uh, one of the earliest ones. But we have the writings on uh, Elliot Rogers, who everybody who's an incel kind of worships. You know, he's their hero kind of thing. And he was so clear. And when he, he even picked out a date when he was going to do his uh, his shootings, which he did. He killed seven people and injured another 11. Yeah. And he carried it out. When you first started speaking about putting manifestos and, and writings into into AI, the first thing that popped into my head was, oh, you're not talking about serial killers. You're talking about these mass shooters. And I'm, and, and I'm wondering, is there some kind of uh, psychological or a uh, linkage between these two types of- Or is it the two? modern day serial killer? Well, well, we could test that out actually and compare them. You can either have unsupervised or supervised kinds of machine learning. Yeah, and that's so that's so fascinating because people I don't think people think about machine learning and artificial intelligence in that in that context, right? That can make a huge difference. What's when when are you planning on publishing? Do you have a, a sort of date? Well, we have one one paper that is accepted in the threat assessment management that will be coming out this month, and we're on our second paper. Um, so it's in the works. The beauty of the AI is all of this data that can take you weeks and months to read can be done in a second. Wow. That's it incredible. It, it really is. Uh, I still can't wrap my head around how they can do it so fast. But My sister went to Boston College and I would visit. And she knows, oh. of course, your name and you and who you are. And mm -hmm. it's such an honor to have you on here. I did want to ask you this. Looking back at your span of work and what you've done, and I was talking to Dan last night and saying she's just amazing and so nice and this and that. How and Susan was you, right. <laughs> how are you able to separate it? Be the the grandmother mm -hmm. that you are and the mother that you are and everything that you are, the teacher that you are, and able to separate what you hear and see. Yeah. When nursing does that, the way we're trained as nurses, you have to be able to separate because you see all kinds of very disturbing things, whether it's take and you have to take care of people that have gone through a lot. So I think that we learn that is, is just basic nursing. I still work cases and I, I just, you, just because you've done a lot of cases doesn't mean that you don't get rattled. I still get rattled over some of the things I see and hear and have to deal with and explain to people. You have to compartmentalize. You can't yeah. go thinking about, but that doesn't mean that you don't think about these cases. Well, Anne, thank you so much. It's been an honor for lending your expertise to us and your knowledge. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Uh, enjoy this very much, both of you. Thanks so much for watching Headline Crime. I'm Susan Hendricks. And I'm Dan Semitovich. If you liked that interview with Dr. Ann Burgess, you're going to love part two, in which we talk about the Menendez brothers. Yeah, she was an expert witness, Dan, as you know, in the first trial in the early 90s, both of the trials ended in a mistrial. What Dr. Ann Burgess says about the possibility of the Menendez brothers walking out of prison. And the best way to make sure that you see that is to subscribe to our channel, set your alerts and keep an eye out. That'll be coming soon. Until then, Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your time. And wherever you are around the world, thank you again and take care. See you soon. The perception of what people see on the outside, their Beverly Hills home to really what's going on inside. Do you see our society since then in the 90s having changed significantly to where you think they have a shot at getting out? Was there an instigating incident that you think actually led them to finally cross that line? Whenever you have two in any type of crime, uh, there usually is one that's more dominant, let's put it that way, than the other. And that certainly was the case here. Back in the 90s in high school, I thought, well, they killed their mom too. And now knowing what I've known based on testimony and based on what I've read, it's disgusting.